Okay, so um, I'd like to thank Ben for doing a great job keeping us on time up till, up till now. We're a little bit behind. I'd like to thank everybody for their patience. Um, this has been a fabulous conference from my point of view. I learned so much. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. Uh, from the questions I can tell, people liked your talk. We're not gonna have a showcase. It's gonna be a little harder because we've got six projects to show. Um, uh, Edwin from um, Respira Works is gonna work first. I'd like to invite Michelle Melantine, Professor Michelle Melantine and Dr. Schultz and Pierre Longcamp to uh, go off mic and jump in here with questions. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have um, the uh, showcase presenters pre present very briefly and then we might have two minutes of questions on their showcase work. And then that is the end of the conference. But we, I think we can have more questions about all of those projects at the end of this. Uh, but, I, but I am gonna try to keep it going here. And hopefully we don't have any technical problems. So um, I, Edwin, why don't you go ahead and come off mic and do whatever sharing you wanna do. And I'm gonna introduce Respiraworks because they're a team that I've interacted with quite a bit. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of great people working out there, but Respiric Works is one of the larger and better organized and more open uh, teams, which has been building a ventilator. Uh, so I'd like to thank them for presenting. Go ahead, Edwin. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are RespireWorks. I trust you guys can see the uh, can see the slides here. But we are a team of roughly we're just five shy of 200 at this point: engineers, doctors, project managers, software developers around the world. I think we're in nine countries, three continents now. Um, I think possibly four. But uh, this is what we're working on. Uh, early on in our project, we made the decision to pursue something that's uh, a, a bit closer to a traditional ICU vent and uh, in terms of its features and its, uh, and its operation, uh, with the main difference being that it is open source and, uh, and the IP is not controlled and owned. So along those lines, this, the, the design, it's a blower driven design that is made to run on electricity alone if the patient needs only 21% ambient air. So it, it has a blower that can compress ambient air to provide that pressure. We have patient synchrony modes that, uh, that give pressure assist and pressure support. We've currently demonstrated pressure assist mode and we're currently working on adding pressure support to the, the software package. Uh, this ventilator also features inhale and exhale filtering to keep patients safe. You know, it's very much on our minds, patient and, uh, and medical staff isolation. We have a full graphical UI with a large seven inch display uh, that can be operated with gloves on and it does provide patient data live plotting and logging and there is a full suite of settable visual and audio alarms uh, compliant with 80601 and a uh, it's currently designed for an external battery backup but uh, based on feedback that we've been getting from clinicians and therapists we are now pursuing an internal battery option as well and the the critical specifications of the of the vent are, are pretty standard and they're listed there at the bottom to keep uh, respiratory rate, FiO2 and such. A few words about the testing that we've done and sort of our main activity right now has been testing the design. Uh, we have several areas of testing. We've been doing reliability testing over the last several months and we're happy to say that we now have the equivalent of over 100 days of continuous operation being done on all of the moving parts, some of which are custom designed. So we feel like that reliability testing is critical to demonstrate that the, um, that the parts can, can meet the continuous rigors of uh, patient support. We've also been doing performance testing. Uh, thanks to our software team, we have a very robust set of debug tools that allow us to run uh, consistent automated testing. So it allows us to run the same uh, test profile every single time whenever there are design changes or code changes, we can rerun all of our performance tests and compare the data. And, uh, and plot it. And these, uh, like many of the other teams, these tests are based on the uh, 80601 test cases. And we do quite a bit of functionality testing as well. This is the, the testing for the ventilator's proper behavior in response to both user clinician uh, interactions. So this is the GUI, the, the buttons, how to turn it on, how to run the power on self checks, things like that. And then also the patient functionality meaning that the event responds correctly to patient breathing effort and such. 
and uh, our software team has been hard at work at Im uh, implementing code coverage based software testing and uh, Martin's on this call. He can answer more questions about that as I'm not quite as familiar with that um, with that effort right now, but uh, we are pursuing full test coverage of all of our code in a, in a documented and consistent way. Um, uh, videos are always are always fun. So I'd love to um, show just a quick clip of what we have running so far. Um, so you can see the uh, user interface running here. We're running on an Ingmar test long. This is the unenclosed version of the ventilator. So it's kind of sitting out in parts on a uh, worktop bench. But this, um, this, uh, this is a good demonstration just to show what we have working right now and the interaction with the user interface and live plotting. Uh, a few words about manufacturability. Our, our design has, from the ground up, been designed to be free of medical supply chain components. So we're really trying to focus on parts from automotive and industrial um, industrial sources. This was very true at the beginning and still quite true now that uh, parts that are in the medical supply chain have been very hard to get, particularly for countries that don't sit at the first world table. Uh, the, the design is based on common folded sheet metal and flat panel construction, so very basic manufacturing required. And the electrical components are based around a, uh, a common electrical PCB process that requires no special technology. So this is sort of can be built with, uh, with regular consumer manufacturing processes, uh, provided that it meets medical standards. Um, one very important thing uh, to close off on is that, you know, I think what's special about this ventilator, like I said before, we're, we're really trying to pursue something that isn't really all that special in terms of its capability or functions, it's very similar to a fully featured ICU vent, but that uh, the difference being that we have a, a very strong commitment to the open source. And um, our, our philosophy is that, you know, countries, countries have a lot of resources. And if the IP is owned by another company that's making and distributing these ventilators, then money is really the only resource they can use to um, uh, is, is the only is the only resource they can use to get medical supplies to the people they care for. And so, with an open source, IP free design, uh, it allows countries and organizations to use local manufacturing, local labor, local expertise, local distribution in order to help their people. Um, and this moves, this is important because it moves the motivation to, from those designing and owning the design of event uh, to those who are manufacturing and getting it into hospitals uh, at the bedside of people who need it. And um, this is, this is what we do. We are, we are Respearworks and our mission is to radically democratize the ventilator. Thank you very much, Edwin. Um, I, go ahead, doctors. So, thank you, Edward. I'll, I'll jump on the question and I'll just ask one. Yeah, you mentioned you know, functional testing and software testing, uh, but I didn't see any mention of biocompatibility and electrical safety. Where do you stand with that? Yeah, that's definitely something that's on our minds. I don't think we're ready to do that testing yet. That requires will require some planning and getting those resources. But right now, that is limited to design-based um, mitigation, meaning that we're selecting our materials and also designing in a transient voltage and EMI suppression uh, design into our circuitry, but we don't yet have the resources to close that loop with testing, which we will need to do. We currently have partners in India which are helping us to do the manufacturing and testing and they have those resources. So when we are ready and we're, we're getting there quickly, uh, we will engage their help to do that testing. But you, you have identified the technical requirements individually regarding biocompatibility and electrical safety? I don't think I don't think I can say that we have a full understanding of that. We're still learning it. Okay. Let me submit a question from the audience. I'd like to combine these two questions because they're related. Uh, Claire Waters and Luther Johnson asked, how are you getting automotive parts FDA cleared or what have you done for biocompatibility and safety of breathable gases through the industrial non-medical components? What did you do about this part of the problem? Yeah, this is a difficult question to answer. And I think it, the, the answer will have to be a lot of testing um, in order to, I, I, we have, I, I come from the aerospace background, particularly SpaceX. And the way we, we address that, you know, using non-space components, we, we build a lot of our things using automotive components. And then the onus of the verification that these parts are appropriate and safe to use 
in space applications falls upon the design and manufacturer to to show. And I think that this is something that we will have to do is uh, the question being, is it possible? And I think that we are going to find out. And if it's not, there are very clear pathways to medical components as replacements, but this will increase the cost and lower the availability of the design to, to the general public. Okay, thank you, Edwin. I have to, uh, go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> it's a, hopefully it's a, it's a pretty quick question. So kind of coming from the standpoint of um, I've been helping people try to find ventilators in the developing world and see kind of like trying to track groups like where they're at to find, you know, if it's not a solution in the next two weeks, when might this ventilator be a viable solution for a particular region? What is sort of the timeline that you guys have? Yeah, I think when we made that early decision to pursue a more feature rich uh, ventilator, we we are targeting a longer timeline. I think that we we ha we admitted to ourselves that we probably wouldn't be quick enough to address the first wave of the pandemic. And we're really focused more on the long tail of the pandemic, as well as providing something that will have a uh, will have a lasting benefit after the pandemic, uh, which probably means that we're we're going to pursue a full 510k um, approval, which is much further out. So uh, we're probably looking at six months to a year. Okay, Pierre, are are we ready to go on? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, I I thank sort you. of uh, interrupted. There. Um, let me introduce uh, Professor Michelle Melantine. It may not be obvious why she's here. She was a speaker at the first VentCon, and she is a professor at Colorado Mesa University. I may have that not exactly right. And her postdoc was in ventilator induced lung injury. So she is not a medical doctor, but she is an expert in some aspects of, of this field. So um, Darren from 